Why did Jesus feed another 4,000 people? That's what we're going to talk today in Mark 8. Do you know half the time I record these podcasts, I say Matthew and not Mark? Boy, I'm going to get it through. But Luke will be easier, right? Because it's a whole other letter. All right, so now the great crowd is gathered again. Have nothing to eat. Yet again, Jesus calls his disciples to him. I have great compassion for the crowd. Again, that heart thing. They have been with me now for three days and they have nothing to eat. If I send them away and tell them to go home, they'll faint on the way home. And some of these people came from a really long place away. Another Jill paraphrase. So the disciples said, well, how can we feed these people, you know, in this middle of nowhere? How many days ago was that? And still they're not getting it. Again, how many loaves do you have? This time they had seven loaves. Again, he tells them to sit down, maybe in the pasture because he's the shepherd, takes the seven loaves, given thanks, breaks it to his disciples. Boy, isn't this like Passover again or communion? They had a few fish too. He blessed them. Then there were basketfuls of food. Everyone ate until they were satisfied. Jesus takes care of his sheep. They took the broken pieces that were left over and there were still seven basketfuls. This was about 4,000 people as compared to the first time. And he gets into the boat. So they went to another district. Question, is maybe this the same story as the other story and somehow it just got mentioned twice? Or is this a whole other feeding? And I think it's pretty clear, at least, you know, when we saw Matthew, different circumstances, different amounts of bread and loaves, that this is a different session of this. This is a different time of it. And so then the question is, is why are they so close but yet different? And why is it the disciples still don't get it? There's so many places, even the basket that was used in Greek were different and where they put the end fragments that were there. And yet they leave in a boat, but they're going somewhere else. Matthew has both feedings in there. Mark records both feedings in there. And the idea I think most people agreed on when they looked at the different commentaries is that there would be some understanding that this miracle was huge and that people would say, oh, that probably didn't really happen. Someone brought snacks and they just distributed them. The reason you have it twice is that there's no misunderstanding. This is what happens. This is the path that happens and this is how he did it. This is a miracle. You can't deny it. It was so good. It happened twice. Okay. So then the Pharisees come back and start to argue with him. And this time they want a sign from heaven. Then they were doing this as a test. Again, they don't believe he is from heaven. They don't believe he's the Messiah. So they keep trying to trip him up. Again, I think that with a different kind of heart, the Pharisees would be in love with Jesus. And many of the first disciples of Jesus were Pharisees, but because they're trying to do God's will. But they don't have that spirit. Again, I think this is that hardening thing. They wanted to trip him up. They wanted to show him for the con man or the devil worshiper he was, in their view. And so they keep asking for that. And Jesus, it says, sighed deeply in the spirit. You know you're in trouble when somebody sighs deeply in the spirit. Why do you seek a sign? I say to you, no sign is going to be given to this generation, to this group of people. I'm not doing it. So he left him. There's a little bit more details in Matthew about this story, but he gets in the boat and then he goes to the other side. He's leaving them. You know, they want a miracle. They want to see a flash of lightning. They want to see God conjure up a tornado. I don't know what it is, but this is not it. But it says in Matthew that Jesus told them the sign of Jonah. This isn't a contradiction because he said, there's no sign. I'm not giving you a sign because the sign of Jonah is not a sign. He's just saying, you want a sign? Go look to what happened to Jonah. That's a sign. That's what's going to happen to me too, because I'm going to be in the earth for three days. That's not a sign. That's a prediction. In this case, Mark is much shorter with them and leaves. Again, man of action. I think the Romans would appreciate this because, again, they probably didn't like the Jewish infrastructure very much. They didn't believe in that religion. They, all these people with all these rules. And so they don't want to get bogged down in this. They like the fact that this man speaks for himself. He says the word of God coming right from him. And they're not debating passages and chapters of things. Jesus is telling them flat out what's going to happen. And then Jesus says, you know, watch out, quote, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, meaning the Sadducees, Herod's group, because again, it was Herod the Great who replaced the entire temple structure. And I'm sure his son was doing the same thing. These are people that you're not supposed to trust. 
because just like leaven can be a good thing, like the beginning church and how it was going to spread like leaven in flour, this is bad leavening. And the same way, it can start infecting all sorts of people. Then they started talking more about why they had no bread. We have no bread. What do we mean about leavening? We've talked about that in Matthew too. And Jesus is annoyed now. He's like, well, why are you discussing the fact you have no bread? Do you not understand what I'm talking about? Your, are your hearts hardened? You have eyes you don't see. You have ears you don't hear. And you don't remember anything, which is true. We just fed all those people. If Jesus wanted to, he could bring up all the food he wanted to. He could make fish jump into the boat, whatever. They don't even have a memory for the things that he just got done doing. He said that, quote, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? 12 baskets. Okay. And 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Well, seven of them. He said to him, don't you understand? So here we get that clear picture. This isn't like many people have said, or many commentaries have said, these were not a mushing of one event into two stories. Jesus points out, these are two stories, different bread, different people, and they're not getting it. You're sitting there and arguing about the fact you have no bread. And I, I just made all the bread you could ever knew. And they just don't even get it. And he even calls them out for their hearts being hardened. Boy. Tough talk from Jesus. You know, I think Matthew, like I said, Matthew must have been a sunnier guy. Got some of the better points of it. But Jesus is much harsher in his language, certainly to the apostles. So they get to Bethsaida, which is the place they were originally going. And they brought him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Again, they want to do actions. It's funny how people get sort of witchcrafty. And I don't mean it like in sense of witchcraft, but when you... You spill salt, right? And then something lucky happens to you. Then you say, oh, you got to spill salt in order to have good luck or do this thing or do that. We are people who are always looking for patterns in worship, in things that happen with God. That's why we also fall away. We're, we're religion inventors. But in this case, people are now trying to touch his cloak, you know, trying to touch him to get healed. But he goes to the blind man let him out of the village, you know, and then he spits on his eyes, lays his hands on him and says, do you see anything? And the man says, well, people look like trees walking, which means it's fuzzy. You know, he can't quite see exactly what it is. So then Jesus lays his hands on him. So we're getting a two stage miracle. So then Jesus puts his hands on his eyes and the sight was restored. Everything was perfectly clear. And he sends them home and says, don't go into the village. Again, we're, we don't want this message getting out. So now why are we spitting into our hands and touching the man's face and then not having it fully there? And so we have the second stage where he puts his hands on his face. I think, again, this healing is about the blind man can't see what Jesus does. He can hear him, unlike the deaf and mute man. But Jesus is giving something he can feel. He can feel the water on his eyes. I mean, it's gross, right? But he can feel the water on his eyes. He can feel Jesus touching his face. And then the question comes in, why two stages? This is the first time Jesus didn't heal someone completely the first time. And I think for most of the commentaries I read, it is because the sight of God, how we see God comes in phases. The apostles keep believing and then not believing and acting like they don't believe. And slowly but surely, they are going to come along and they're going to get it, you know, and unfortunately, it's going to be after Jesus dies. But that is how faith in God happens. It happens in stages. The view of God clears up over time. And so that is why a lot of people feel like that was it, is that he is sort of indicating because, again, the eyes were considered to be the windows of the soul. When you see good things, you see the light. You don't see the light of God the first time out. And I even, you know, think for myself, becoming a Christian, did I see everything God had to offer me the very first time that I became a Christian, the first day? There were a lot of things like, mm, I don't know if I believe in that, but I'm going to put a pin in it and we'll talk about it later. I have a lot of things to consider. So then Jesus went with Peter to the village of Caesarea Philippi. Again, this is going to be 
a differences area than where Pilate lives. So this has statues and places, and they must have been confronted with all these other beliefs and idols that were there. And so then Jesus asked them, well, who do people say that I am? And so it says they told him. It doesn't say, like in Matthew, what they said. And so they said, came back and said, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think you're Elijah. You're a prophet, which is not the right answer, of course. They were waiting for Elijah to come back to announce the Messiah. The prophets were there to announce the Messiah. And John the Baptist wasn't also the Messiah, even though he had been preaching for many years and people knew who he was and what he meant. So then here comes the direct question. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah. Much more forward, again, because the Romans aren't going to have the background. They're not going to know the prophecies. He's coming out clearly and saying it. You are the Messiah. And again, he says, don't tell anyone about it. Close to the area. We don't want this getting out too quickly before we start getting cracked down upon. Jesus then tells him about his death and resurrection and is giving them the indication what's going to happen. He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected by the temple structure, the chief priests. But then after three days, rise again. I think in Matthew was a little, brought in the sign of Jonah again, but now he's saying it quite out. And Peter is like, no, this is not going to happen, <laughs> right? He rebukes him because he doesn't want Jesus to die. He doesn't want these things to happen. Jesus turns around, looking at his disciples, you know, checking around it, and then he says, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but instead the things of man. You've been listening to me. You've been understanding what's happening. I am coming here to save mankind from the original sin of Adam. This goes all the way back. And you want me not to do it. You want me to avoid this happening. And it is absolutely going to happen. People wonder, again, as always, whether or not he's calling Peter Satan. Is he indicating that Peter is listening to Satan and Jesus is telling Satan to get away from Peter? Or is what Peter is saying of Satan, and he's rebuking it all. You know, we don't, of course, know that, but I always think of it more like he sensed the presence of Satan right there, who's whispering in Peter's ear. And he says, you know what? If anyone's going to come after me, he's going to have to deny himself and take up his cross. Follow him. So first of all, that cross, for us, is, it's an issue of faith. We recognize the cross as a faith issue, but to them, they knew that the cross means a persecution of the Roman military. These were people under the thumbs of the Romans and people were crucified. They would have seen this as a suffering issue. And if you save your life, you're going to lose it. And if you lose your life for my sake, the gospel, the good news, the good tidings will save you. I always love this. What is a profit of man to lose the whole world and forfeit his soul? This is ESV. And whoever is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed. I'm not reading directly in here, but you get it. When he comes in glory of his Father and the holy angels at the end, I'm going to be ashamed of you too. This is hard talk. It surprises me that when Jesus does die, this doesn't come back to them. He says literally, I'm going to rise up in three days. If you deny me, I'm going to be ashamed of you too. This is Peter. Boy, tough stuff, right? So we had a very tough ending to chapter eight. Sure, all of this took a lot of time to soak in of what he was saying. So my meditation this week is going to be about how does one set their mind on the things of God? How can we get to that place where we stop thinking about the earthly things? I mean, it is hard, right? We're thinking about what we're having for dinner. I'm not saying any of these things are bad. We think about how we want the church to go. We want this world to go. And when we see things happening in a way that we don't anticipate or something in the world happens that we did not want to happen or something happens in our government that we did not want to happen, we can rebuke it. We can get angry about it. But we don't see that God is in control of the whole world. Things are going according to his plan. And we need to consider more what is God's plan. It is the gospel in the end that will save our life even when we falter, when we're threatened by things in this world. My prayer this week 
is going to be about how we each need miracles in different ways. I, I, I've been struck about all of this, about the man who was deaf and mute and how Jesus healed him, and now the blind person who was healed in two stages. You know, something in miracles are different for each of us. I think, too, like when I became a Christian, I expected that if anyone was going to commit me of a faith, it was going to be because of some masterful speech, some amazing thing that was said that's just going to rock my world. And that's not how it happened. God knows how we really operate. He understands, again, how the seeds grow. And so we're all just a little bit different. And what I'm going to tell people is the fact that God and his miracles are different, different for different people. He comes to us where we are. He talks to us in a way we understand. Notice his temperament can be very different with his different apostles. He talks to Peter pretty harshly. And I'm guessing it's because Peter is that guy who can handle it. Peter seems to have a strong ego. Peter seems to be a pretty strong guy, a natural leader, a bit abrupt at times, but Jesus knows how to talk to him directly. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstuffswithgod.com. I would love to be able to provide tools or resources, or I just, you know, I'm interested, did something strike you? Has something been interesting to you in this whole podcast? Or did you just have a different point of view about something? I'd love to hear it. So please have a wonderful day and take care.